There is a Regency garment that just does not get the love that it deserves. Often forgotten because it seems unnecessary to complete the look or dismissed for not looking pretty enough, which is probably why no one in Bridgerton is wearing one. Except for Eloise, sort of. This, like everything else in the show, is a fantasy version of Regency, so it's okay. I'm talking about chemisettes, which we would probably identify as a dicky in modern fashion, but back 200 years ago, they were little chemises that go under and sometimes over the gown and just below the bust. They don't have sleeves, so they're not real shirts. In English-speaking countries, they were more likely to be called tuckers because they literally tucked into your bodice. They exist to fill in the wide, often low neckline of the gown and are an incredibly versatile accessory. They help block the sun from your chest in an age before oxybenzone or whatever is in modern sunscreens. They can dress up a plain outfit and can be mixed and matched with all different kinds of ensembles. They can even dress down an outfit and take a somewhat fancy dinner dress and make it more suitable for day wear. If you're going to do a day wear Regency dress and want to take your outfit to the next level and make it look legit, nothing does that better than a chemisette. A dress paired with a chemisette instantly takes the look from costumey to authentic, and they're such a great way to be creative with ruffles or lace or maybe even use up some scrap fabric. But if chemisettes are so great, why have I never made one? So in the past, I've just used fichus to fill in my necklines, which is a totally legitimate alternative. They're basically just neckerchiefs or either squares or triangles of fabric that gets tucked into the neckline of the gown. It's the same thing we see worn in the 18th century and that is carried on into the Regency period. But now is the time to make a proper chemisette, or two in this case. And I actually started one a long time ago, and it's one of my very few historical UFOs that are left. So I wanted to show you this chemisette work in progress that I must have started years ago and never finished. But my problem is I can't find any more of this really fine Batiste cotton to finish a collar of any kind. But I did want to show you something that I thought was uh, a little funny. So when I first started historical costuming, I was coming from the world of modern machine sewing. And in modern sewing, when you do something by hand, the idea is that you don't want any of it to ever show. You want it to be as invisible as possible. So back then I was wondering, okay, well, what are hand stitches supposed to look like if you're supposed to see them? And none of the museum photos of extant garments or even blogs of recreations showed what the stitches were supposed to look like. So I just kind of guessed. And so I made these really chunky, thick running stitches. And I realize now they're supposed to be much smaller. But I just wanna say that if you're new to this, you're gonna make some mistakes. There's gonna be some things that you have a hard time figuring out what you're supposed to do. It's a learning process. You're just gonna keep learning, that's okay. But for my next version of this, I'm going to sew it a little bit differently. I'm going to trace this half finished chemisette and use it as a pattern, but this isn't going to be a strict tutorial. I will link in the description to a free pattern tutorial and a pattern you can buy. And the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Dressmaking has two chemisette patterns as well. The great thing about chemisettes is they don't require a lot of fitting so long as they reach long enough to be tied under the bust and are wide enough to stay tucked under your dress shoulders. I'm making one chemisette from leftover cotton organdy from my 1840s ball gown. My other fabric is a thin, lightweight cotton lawn which is leftover from my 1908 lace dress. Basically any white, sheerish, natural fiber fabric will work. Many chemisettes have lace collars. Some bodies are gathered or tucked or embroidered, but I'm keeping mine simple and plain. My first step was sewing the shoulders, and I'm using a mix of machine and hand sewing for these projects. I'm actually sewing a French seam, which makes a nice seam finish for sheer fabrics and hides the machine stitch as well, but I don't know if it's very period correct. After that, I kind of decided that my body pieces were too wide. This isn't a problem with my lighter weight cotton, which gathers easily, but it is with the organdy, so I slimmed the sides down to the waistline. Next, I hand sewed the outer edges. 
The organdy is crisp and easily holds a folded edge, but the lawn is easier to sew. I'm trying my best to only pick out a couple threads per stitch, and since the organdy is so stiff, it took twice as long to sew as the lawn. Could I just have machine sewn this? Probably, seeing as it's probably not going to show when I wear the chemisette. But I did it by hand anyway. Up until this point, the chemisettes are basically identical, but now it's time to do the collars. There are multitudes of collar options in this period with lace, pleats, or ruffles, v-neck or high jewel neck. The big neck ruff was popular throughout the Regency era, but I want to keep things a bit simpler, so I'm going for a pleated standing collar with the organdy version, because I want something to wear under my black Spencer jacket. For my lawn version, I really love the shirt collar style that was popular in the first half of the Regency. For the organdy, I need to take a few measurements and cut a strip of fabric that is one and a half times the length of my neckline. Then I'll slice the rectangle in half at an angle. That way the collar will be taller at the back of my neck and shorter at the center front. But since I don't have a ruler this long, my cutting wasn't very exact. So I had to do a little extra trimming to make both collar halves symmetrical. I have to sew two ends together to make the back of my collar, and this time I'm actually sewing the seam by hand and flat felling it down rather than French seaming because I want the seam allowances to lay flat and not rub against the back of my neck. Next I have to hem this very long ruffle edge by hand, of course, because it'll be right up against my face, which means any visible machine stitching would stand out like a sore thumb. But this next part makes up for that because now I get to pleat the collar. And this organdy is a dream to work with. It is so easy to just fold the fabric up by hand and get a nice clean edge. I'm not even bothering to measure the pleats. Now I have to attach the collar and I'm going for a kind of V-shaped neckline, so I'll need to trim the center front area of the chemisette. And I also decided that my ruffle was too tall, so I chopped off an inch from the entire thing. It's always easier to make things smaller than it is to make them bigger, so I like to err on the side of caution and cut things larger if I'm experimenting in a project like this. And now it's time for a book break. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you may have wondered, how does she manage to sew with a toddler running around? Poorly. I sew poorly. At first I thought I would flat fell this neckline seam, but quickly realized that it would be too difficult with all of these pleats. So I cut some bias strips from the cotton lawn and used that to cover the trimmed seam allowance. This one is almost finished, but I wanted to quickly knock out the collar on my other chemisette. So it looks like the American Duchess Guide has a pattern for a shirt style chemisette, except their neckline is shaped differently than the one that I already cut out. So that means that I can't use the collar pattern piece in this book. I'm gonna have to draft my own collar. But that should be okay because I do have this nifty bendy ruler that I could probably use to make something. Once I got an acceptable shape, I cut two collar pieces out of the cotton lawn and one out of some organdy scraps. The organdy will go on the inside to help support the collar and keep it upright. Looking back on this, I might have tweaked the collar shape a bit more, especially the front points. This style of shirt collar is all in one piece, which is a different shape than the two-piece style collars we have in shirts today. 
But again, it's an experiment. The collar gets sewn to the neckline, and I'm doing the same as last time, covering the raw edge in bias binding that gets sewn down by hand. I'm hemming the front edges here too. The finishing bits are the same for both. I have to make a casing for my drawstring. In this case, very thin twill tape. And I sewed it by machine, just because at this point I wanted to be done with this project. It's funny because whenever I'm in the middle of a project, I always get to a point where I can't wait to be finished. And then once I'm finished, I immediately want to do it again. Now I'm thinking of all the collar possibilities. I've got some vintage lace that needs to be used. I want to make one that you wear on the top of your dress with some little flutter sleeves. But until then, I'm happy with how these two turned out. I like that the pleated collar is tall enough to be seen above the collar of my jacket. And I like the kind of casual feel of the shirt collar version. I was worried that the organdy would be a little scratchy since it is so stiff, but it's not. Although if I wanted to make another version specifically out of organdy, I'd go for a slightly softer fabric. Mine is the plain organdy from Renaissance Fabrics, but they carry two finer versions. This was just an attempt to use up some leftovers. And the organdy works very well as an interlining too. Thank you so much for watching. I've got a whole bunch more Regency projects in the works as I try to fill the gaps in my Regency wardrobe. So subscribe if you wanna see those, and if you'd like to keep watching, here's another video.